Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. So this week we're going to kind of continue our discussion and I want to move a little bit more into the actual ideas of dis disaster recovery planning and business continuity. When we say this, there's a pretty much eight ideas or constraints that we want to think about. Uh, the first is really that idea of defining the leadership, which we were talking about last week. And if you remember, I told you about the four stages of structural organizations that Bullman and Thiel are known for. Uh, the political, the human resources, the structural itself, and that kind of charismatic uh, leadership. We can think of the Pope or someone like that. So it's setting those parameters of who is in charge. It's always number one so that everybody knows who to look for, who is their leader, their team leader, who is going to do the communication so the chaos is cut down. That's always the first constraint that I say should really be acknowledged in a plan. You know, everybody's roles are already in there and then mentions from the project management charter itself. Now you're defining deeper inside of those charters. Who's going to do what, when? Who is going to communicate to the CIO? Who is going to communicate to the president? Who is going to communicate, more importantly, to the stakeholders? What if the president is the problem? The president died. Who's going to take over? Who's going to be the leader? Who's going to be the one who is the crisis control communicator for the group, for everyone, each individual department. The second idea is the idea of actually assessing risks. And we can think about this right now. You can assess risks at any time in your life for almost anything or your organization. Let's take a second, grab a piece of paper, and set it in front of you. No matter where you are today, I want you to take a look and say, what is a risk? What is something that looks I'm looking at right now that could influence my day, my life, or my future? Think about it. I'm in my office. I'm on the third floor. And I'm in a building which at any point in any time could be what? Attacked. Catch fire. Do I know how to get out of this office? I'm looking at my door. I'm the only person in the building as usual. How would someone know that I'm here working late at night? They wouldn't. Should I have an idea on how to escape this third floor, to, floor without getting out? What if the smoke is coming through the halls and I can't leave through my door and follow the fire plan, which I've never seen? What would I do? How would I manage this? We should think about these things as well. How do we do this? Who's going to be making these charts and plans? If you're organizing a business structure and you're buying a building as part of your plan, you have to think about things like this and build this into your plan as well. These are small things that we don't think about a lot of times when we're in the IT world. We worry about computers failing, data falling apart. But what happens if there's a power surge and it strikes our computer? How do we handle that? These are all risks that we have to think about. I can look at many of them in my office today. What if the water was sabotaged and I'm drinking out of my water cup that I got from the fountain? I could be instantly sick and everyone here. The whole entire university could go down in minutes. What will we do? How will we handle this? What will we do to get emergency help here? These are all parts of a continuous plan for a business. We have to look at the impact from that if we assess one thing. Well, what's the impact if Dr. Spangler is lost in a fire here in the building? Most of you are giggling right now saying, not much. Well, think about it. Your stop, your classes would stop immediately. All my undergraduates would stop. All the projects that I'm working with them in the community would stop right now for their capstone projects. There'd be no coordination. Someone would first have to assess where I keep all this data and information. Who are the team leaders? How do I have them contact me? Who are the people that I'm contacting in the community? Who could take over my classes? Who could they get right now to help you be a success still? What would they do about where we are? Do they know what I'm talking about? Do I know what books we have? Do they have a copy of my syllabus so we can follow along? These are all things that the, that the department thinks about in a continuity plan. We think about backups. What happens if I get sick and I'm in the hospital, I'm in a car crash? How would you manage this? Well, I have a plan. I usually have your work at least one week to two weeks out and videos and ideas in place. 
and I also make sure that I document everything I do. I do grades as fast as I can, but I have a second person who has access to my computer and knows my passwords personally and can get into everything that I need to be done safely. There's always a way to do this. Department head always makes sure that everybody's syllabus is on file so that everybody needs a copy or someone goes out, they can get them help. So, this is a way of looking at the risks and seeing how they would actually impact us and analyzing them. And a way to mitigate them is really the strategies that you come up with to prepare for this and having a backup for the backup. What if the power goes out? Well, we have emergency generators here, but what if that fails? Think about Fukushima for one minute. What happened there? Power went out. Nuclear rods were flooded. They had backup generators to the pumps. But what happens when, and happened, when the backup generators are flooded and seawall is breached in? What do they do now? Was there a backup plan? How do they get emergency personnel in there to pump the water out and keep it safe? What happens when those fire trucks are using fail? They're bound to do so. These are all things they're having to think about now. Chernobyl is another great example. They're now building a sarcophagus around the failing infrastructure that they had in place. What happens when it fails? Do we build a bigger one? These are all parts of the emergency preparation planning as well. How do we get people out of a building that's on fire? It's not just equipment. Do we take equipment? Do we leave it? What's the cost of a human life versus the cost of a computer? What's the cost of not backing up the data and backing up it on a cloud or having a third-party vendor back it up for us? And more importantly, once you have this in, how do you get that training to your employees? How do you test their ability and measure it? And how do you audit all this to make sure it's being conducted and everything's happening correctly? And once you have these done, how do you look at your plan and say, well, we need to change it? Constant assessment, constant revision, constant allowing yourself to say, we are failures, but that's okay because we learn from failures. We learn from mistakes. Otherwise, we would never move forward. One of the ways we look at things is that risk assessment measurement. And I keep saying measurement, and I'm going to play you a little piece here by one of my favorite authors is Hubbard on how to measure anything. I found a great clip. And he looks at first and describing what are your potential risks. That's the first thing to understand. Just so I said grab that piece of paper. Are you still writing down? Well, I'm still looking around my room. And I still keep thinking, wow, I only have one door out of here. What if that door is blockaded? What if there's a terrorist attack? Could these drywall walls save me from bullets? How, what would I do? Would I climb underneath my desk and hide? Would I break a window and scream for help? These are all things that you would think about in your plan. What is a potential risk? A lot of times you need to get your team managers in place and you have what's called a brainstorming session. We've all done them and we're doing one together right now. You're still looking around. Are you still building your list? Are you still adding up? I'm looking at mine saying, hmm, I have two chairs. I could possibly climb up out over to one of the windows that's in the front and smash it with a light stand that I have here to get out safely if the door was blocked. What else could I do? Well, maybe I could pull a door, the desk in front of the door, if there's somebody coming that's unsafe to sit, you know, help save my life. These are all things that I'm looking at for possible ways to mitigate risk. You have to evaluate that likelihood, too. How likely is something going to happen? How likely is there a fire going to happen? You never know about fire. You never know about a flood. You never know about a tornado. Apparently, the university here had one years before. It can happen. You're evaluating the likelihood and the impact. And once you have this, you start understanding the impact of me. What is the loss of one faculty member, Dr. Spangler? How will we work this out? What would it do to our students? What would it do to the faculty? We have to think about stresses there, too. Your employees are always under a stress. A lot of times, one of the first things you should bring in, to during any risk and when it's happened is counselors. Allowing people to have a safe haven to go to and location area away from a fire, but more importantly, having someone there to mitigate mental illness and making sure stresses are reduced. Looking at how that impacts a workforce can be dramatic.
I've been in places where a great person that we worked with for years passed away of cancer, a very young man. It ended up impacting us deeply. And we ended up changing the, the way we worked, the way we thought, and the way our community acted. We all got health checks. We all started going to the gym for lunch. We all started working out and walking together. And we all started asking each other when you saw somebody wearing dark clothes or down, Hey, how you feeling? Are you okay? Let's get a coffee. Let's go to lunch. That's about empowering others and being greater. These are things you have to think about as well. Once you have all this, and you have all these impacts, and you have all these likelihoods, you need to put it in a list of weight. And it's as simple as looking down the list and saying, well, the most likely thing that could happen here is the power could go out. So we should address that first. And then you figure out a plan. Of, once you prioritize this, to cut down the worry and make an accessible plan for everyone to know how to do it. And once you have that plan, everyone gets a copy. Address everyone's availability to be able to impact the plan, work through the plan. Someone might have hearing issues, someone might have sight issues or physical ailments that will not allow them to help in an emergency situation. These are things that need to be incorporated into the plan as well. These all impact us, but the more we know and the more we can prioritize and then sub break them down into subcategories of independent risks, the more we can alleviate problems and mitigate the risks, and it makes sure that we are continuing in our business and our organization is functioning and our plan is effective. Let's take a minute and watch a little bit of Hubbard. I want you to address and learn how you can quantitatively and qualitatively measure anything at any time. There's two different styles that we really should think about. We know the numbers in the qualitative style is the words. We can count the frequency of how many times someone thinks fire, fire, it was a threat. And we can add that up to get a quantitative analysis, to understand a threat, and then weight them out. Let's take an idea again. What if the power is out for one hour? And let's say we're working in a factory that runs off of electricity to where high amounts of electricity run band saws and they're cutting aluminum to make fence. What would the power outage cost for one hour? You can figure this out in numbers. You can think about how many machines, how many times, how much downtime that will be one hour, how much does it cost to run a machine for hour, how many potential parts do they have to make in an hour, how much is the salary loss per person running this machine. Is there going to be harm to the machine if the power goes down because, let's say, it overheats because the oil is not fluctuating through it? You can then look at the deadlines. When I say deadlines, if the production is down for an hour, what's it going to cost on meeting the deadlines to the stakeholders or the clients you're going to produce? How much is it going to cost you? If you have a contract that says if you, you have to have 800 parts done by 10 o'clock, and every minute after you're charged $5,000, you would have to assess how much that damage cost is going to be for that one hour. Maybe it's shipping costs. In the newspaper business, for instance, they always say stop the press. That never really happens. I've only seen it once in 25 years when I worked there. What happens is, is every minute after midnight, union workers and pressmen go into overtime. And more importantly, the shipping costs of the paper. To get it to a doorstep every hour that's in overtime is three times the regular rate. So you would be able to figure out the cost per paper of what it would be to send out. Or say our parts. Say we ship usually with UPS but we can't ship with them because they stop shipping at 5 o'clock and we have to go to a second party, FedEx, to get our shipment to. They might be double the rate because they go by weight and their cost is more. These are all things we can use to measure, uh, measure and assess the risk. There's alternatives, There's alternatives uh, for, the way, uh, for the way we make observations you know, which things we and which things we should worry about measuring the most. Each of those, In each the of those, solutions, the solutions are pretty non-obvious in a lot of situations. It's easy to come up, with the, to come up with the solution. It's, a, it's, not, a it's, an, it's not a difficult calculation. But Without doing, but some, without of doing some of these calculations, it turns out that people, are pretty, turns out that people are pretty just bad at guessing just intuitively what guessing what they should measure and how to measure it.
Hi, I'm Doug Hubbard. Hi, I'm Doug Hubbard. I'm the author of How to Measure Anything anything and the Failure of Risk Management. The first thing is the basic. The first thing is the basic philosophy about measurement. That it never really meant it never really meant an exact quantity. It never it never it never did to scientists in general. Somehow it evolved into that for management, both on the government side and the commercial side. So that's a key aspect. So that's a key aspect of it. We want to get people to go out there and make observations that reduce their uncertainty about big bets. Just in the last just in the last couple of years, the array of different measurement problems has really gotten interesting. It's been military logistics, military logistics uh, R&D portfolios, uh, R&D portfolios uh, entertainment, uh, media, entertainment portfolios, media portfolios, in which entertainment, in which projects, entertainment to projects to so invest in, and so uh, forth. Uh, and uh, mergers and, uh, and acquisitions, mergers and, acquisitions capital. and venture capital. These are all uh, these across are all the board. Across in the board. Areas, in all these areas, people are confronted, people with, are difficult confronted with difficult problems. measurement problems. And the interesting thing is, and the interesting thing is that the, the difficulty they have the difficulty with measurement, they have with measurement uh, seems, to uh, pretty similar seems to be pretty across similar all across fields. all these different fields. Even though the entire book, Even is, written the entire book is written for managers, uh, there's a lot of meat to it. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of substance to it. To there's a lot of substance to it. It's not fluffy or lightweight. So in certain areas, so I, did certain have areas I did have to get into more uh, detail. I added some uh, new material. I added some new also material because of also events because from, the last two events years. from the last two years. There's a lot of new interesting questions about what to measure. People ask about can you measure or forecast volatility in a market or so forth. And those have always been issues. Those have obviously, always been issues, but obviously a lot more people, are thinking, people are thinking about them now than they were two years and ago. And a lot of the same methods, and a lot of the really same methods still really apply. And of course, the, the underlying, of course, the, philosophy, the underlying on philosophy on both of them the is implied by the title. Is that it, all is that really is it all really is measurable. If somebody thinks something, if somebody important, thinks something's it important, it has to have observable effects. It can't be both important, it can't be and, both utterly important and utterly invisible, undetectable in any way, directly or indirectly. That just doesn't occur. King, I wanted you to hear his voice, and most importantly, I, I played that because it is more of kind of advertorial for his book, and I strongly suggest you get his books. I've read all of them. They're very good. But the key point in there I wanted you to hear outside of my voice was the fact that, number one, we always think we have to have the exact number on something, and you don't. A good estimate and a good guess is a good way to figure out one, and categorize one, is the, is what is most important to analyze. What's going to have the greatest amount of impact on you? You have to understand the risks. We have risks everywhere we go. But more importantly, the impact of the risk. And that way you focus on the most important ones. We can label something and we can give it a value. We can give the values A. It doesn't have to be one. And you can understand that A is the most important or D is the most important to you, whatever the value is. You don't have to have a specific number or quantity. It just has to have a value of importance and a weight. Once you do this, you can start to understand the scope of the impact of what it's going to actually impact upon you, your business or your structure, your business flow, your management style. You can understand then the time of the impact recovery. I like to say this because it's not so much about the actual impact in a lot of cases. It's how long will it take you to recover. If you're down, for example, one hour because of electricity, how long will it take you to recover? Do you need to ask your workforce to stay an extra hour? If you do so, you're going to have to pay them overtime in most cases. And you have to add that into the equation of how long will it take me to recover? These are all thoughts that you have to think about impact analysis. Is there an alternative that can help you save money and time? Instead of offering everybody overtime, maybe you can offer everybody a free lunch. It would be less cost and money or pay for dinner if everyone stays to help the business out. Maybe you offer that hour back for everybody can take off an hour early one day the next week whenever they like. These are alternative methods to help reduce the impact and the cost and the time and the scopes and get you back in focus and working together and so your organization is running forward. Overall it's about mitigating those risks and a lot of times they're internal risks that are the largest things for recovery. We usually look at that financially for the cost of paying extra to employees, re- reinstituting new hardware that was destroyed, 
you can find many emergency plans that actually have alternative ideas out there if you Google it or you look at some of the business model plans that are out there. Almost all of them have a backup to the backup. And really good plans go as far as four stages or five stages of backups for everything that can happen. They have, if they're Fukushima, they have the idea of we have a backup generator, but we have an emergency response plan. What happens if the fire trucks come out? We call for help from other countries, and we get them involved. These are all methods to creating a plan that is safer, better, and allows you to get back on track faster and more organized. I love to do fire drills, as I call them, and I mentioned, I believe, this before in one of our lectures or last week, and I call it first, test a plan at random times, and don't wait for your milestones. Every milestone, do a test and revise your plan to move forward, but do a test randomly. First thing, when everybody walks in for the day, or right when they're ready to leave, throw a test out there. They have a training exercise of a fire drill. See how fast everyone can get out and get in. Maybe when they're low right back from lunch and everybody has has all of their energy drained and they're filled with good food and they're tired from eating their turkey sandwiches after Thanksgiving, throw the training in right then. Throw them off kilter. See what happens and evaluate that. Audit the actual methodologies that are happening and see what you can do to foster new and more positive outcomes. This is also plan maintenance. Once you have this evaluation, you immediately need to reevaluate your plan and interject the new ideas, the follies, and things that happened and change your plan accordingly. Then, of course, communicate that to your workforce. This is the one goal that most people forget to do. They forget to reorganize and recommunicate new plan initiatives. We can do this at every milestone, but if you find that you did a test and something happened, immediately rework this into your continuously plans and get it back out to your organize, organization and all your employees. Risk is really threat, the likelihood, the vulnerability, and the impact. It impacts a lot of things, and we talked about that today, too. The people, the processes, and how they do things might change, and technology. They also have the infrastructure can, have, can be a risk. The buildings fail. Transportation may stop, and workers can't get to towns. If they live in a big city, they might not be able to get to a train. Let's look at New York. Look at 9-11, September 11th. Let's go back in time. What were some of the big problems they've looked at later and they're still trying to figure out how to, how to create models to stop this if it happens again? Number one was communication. Everyone was in chaos. Police weren't talking to fire. Fire weren't talking to EMS. EMS was not talking to the county. Everybody was in, was in panic. There wasn't a chain of events that helped each other understand who is the key stakeholders and each organization need to communicate and what that line of chain of command was. Transportation was down. People couldn't get out of the city. People were trapped. People couldn't get into the city. They couldn't communicate back and forth to find if anyone was safe or needed help. Commerce had stopped. They physically couldn't get people in and out of the city, so they had to shut it down and have people walk out of the city. The stock market stopped, which stopped complete commerce on, on the country. And even worse was quality of life. The fear. That's still happening today. People don't want to go back to work. They're scared. What if it's our building? What if it's on my block? What if it's in our water? These are all quality of life issues. They had to bring in counselors from across the country to help out. Sometimes, quality of life can be brought down and stress can be reduced on a regular basis if you bring in care workers to your organization. Simple things such as bringing in pets. Out there, there is dogs that you can bring into your workspace that are healers. They, they're very gentle animals. They'll go into the offices and just allow a worker to pet a dog for five minutes. Have many massages throughout a one-month reward. If you want a mini-massage, take it on your lunch break. Offer 
your employees' health impact resolves by giving them gym memberships, which reduces your health care costs. These are all things that can help. They can also help in times and after times of great impact and stress, such as 9-11. All these things were brought in. I'm saying them for a reason. Most of this is all goes back to your system life cycle. There's kind of five predominant stages at initiation phase where you enact all of this in your plan, communicated to all of your employees. You have to analyze the requirements to make sure everybody understands them, make sure everybody is able to do their required position inside of an emergency drill let's say. If someone's handicapped, you may have to alter their plan for that specifically. You have to look at the design and have everybody put input into them. Just because your team came up with it doesn't mean it's perfect and you have to be flexible and allow that to happen. You have to have maintenance, constant testing, constant revision, constant training. And you have to have a disposal phase. That's a closeout like we have in project management where we talk about it, we assess it, we analyze it, and we look at all the data past every single test that we've done on this system analysis, let's say, and we see what we need to do to keep constant improvement of it. I took a look at some list of threats, natural and man-made. And you start dreaming them up, and I'm sure you guys can add a lot of them. We talked about a few. Fire, flood, hurricane, snow, snow melt. Tsunamis are something that's starting to be, unfortunately, more and more common today because of weather condition changes. Broken water mains, I've seen destroy businesses many of times. Same as tornadoes. Droughts can do the same. Think about how a drought would influence the farming market and the stock markets. Out west is a key place where we get all of our fruits and vegetables, and right now there is low water. An earthquake. Today, one of the new industries is drilling. It's causing earthquakes, apparently. What would happen if they're drilling in your area and all of a sudden an earthquake happens? Do you have preparation for this to get your people out of a building if it's three stories or above? What would you do? What happens if there's a, <laughs> a pandemic? Everybody catches the flu. We think first to these man-made threats. A lot of them nobody thinks about right off the bat, but it does happen. What if somebody comes in and steals all your computers? What if somebody sabotages them? Vandalism, piracy, counterfeiting. Labor strikes are one of the large things that strike any organization that have unions in them today. Protests we talked a little bit about before. Then a group anonymous. Look how powerful they are, and they're able to change the world. They've actually changed world leaderships. Think what they can do to your business if you do something wrong. How would you mitigate this? What would the crisis control mechanisms be in place? This would be something you'd have to think about. Terrorism. It's always a possibility, unfortunately, today. Same with workplace violence. Do you have a plan? We never know, unfortunately. What about war? Think about it in the history, how war has changed us. Think about in the 40s, what it did in World War II. America lost its entire male workforce. What had to happen to every organization to keep them functioning? Yes, Rosie the Riveter came out. Women were trained and took over the jobs. This might be something that would have to be placed inside your plan. What if you had a data attack and you lost everything? Do you have a backup? Do you have another fail-safe? Are you writing things down like my eye doctor on an old-fashioned card that can be keyed back in? Painstaking, but could be done. What if there's an oil or water attack in your area? You'd have to get your employees out. If they don't have water, you can't have them there. A lot of these threats are something we don't think about. And in today's world, as good project managers, and soon you guys will be building this into your plans as disaster recovery planning masters, you're going to be thinking about all these little things. How do we mitigate risk? How do we place weight? What's important to us? Gang, thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed today. A little bit of thought and thinking about. Take a minute now and look at that piece of paper in front of you. How many pieces are on that puzzle that you weren't thinking about before? I know what I need to do. 
I need to see about how to get out of here in case of a fire. Have a great day, everyone.